Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Making 2D Minecraft. If you haven't seen the first episode of this series, I have started programming a 2D version of Minecraft in C++. And we got things such as tile rendering, basic terrain generation, lighting, and all other kinds of things done. But today we are going to be taking things to the next level, and start turning this project from a fun little experiment into something truly incredible. So sit down, relax, and enjoy this episode as we continue our journey making 2D Minecraft. Now to start this episode off, if we boot up the game from the last episode, here is what it looks like right now. We have some very simple terrain generation, and we have some oak trees scattered around. But if we move downward, you could see that there's nothing going on underground right now. So to spruce things up, the first thing we are going to be adding today is caves. Now implementing caves, especially in a 2D environment, is actually a fairly straightforward process. Using our fancy Perlin noise generation from the last episode that gives us some smooth noise data, we can have the game erase blocks depending on the value of this noise. To better illustrate the point, here is a grayscale image of Perlin noise that I stole off the internet. Each pixel's brightness is determined by the value of the noise that is returned at its coordinate. So black represents a low value and white represents a high value. If we remove the lowest values from the image and add a background, you could see that it creates this branching, snake-like movement throughout the image. This is how we are going to be creating our Minecraft caves. Now to implement this in code, I have a class called Generator that is able to place blocks in a chunk depending on a set of criteria. In our case, the criteria will be that the noise that is returned by our Perlin noise function is between a certain range that I can fine tune. Now to control the size of the caves, and the general look of the caves, I can also control the noise itself, by changing things such as its frequency. For now though, we will keep things pretty simple. If we look at the world now, we can see that our caves are being generated correctly. Just ignore the holes in the bottom of the world. Now these caves aren't perfect right now, so we'll come back to them later. But for now, let's check them off of our to-do list. Now that we have caves, I'm sure it has become quite apparent that the world doesn't look very good having sunlight shining through all the time. So it is time that I steal a page out of Terraria's book and add walls. Walls are a way for us to add another layer of detail to the world and block out light. And what's nice about them is that they're actually super simple to implement, as most of the code that's needed I could just reuse from the block code. To store the walls, I added an array of them into the chunk class right next to the blocks. If we run our program now, the walls are being displayed correctly, but now the lighting is all messed up. To get it working again correctly with the new tile type, I added some code to check for solid walls when determining when sunlight should shine. And it now works correctly. But the number of tiles being rendered now has basically doubled. Pause. I actually fixed this later on by only rendering the walls that are not obscured by solid blocks. Anyways, continue on. Now that we're done with adding walls, we could check that off of our checklist as well. The next thing on the agenda that I want to add is some variety to the world. And to do that, we are going to be making biomes. Now, I thought that implementing biomes in code would be a pretty straightforward process, but I was wrong. Among the many issues that I had, the most interesting one is that some biomes such as a desert or a plains biome are very flat while others, such as a hill, or even mountain biome, are very bumpy. What's the problem? Well, if these two biomes meet up with each other, and one has a different start height from where the other one ends, then they won't match up vertically to each other. So to fix this problem, I have come up with a system that I call biome interpolation. Interpolation is the process of smoothing a discrete set of data, such as points, into a continuous set of data. What does this have to do with our biome situation? Well, let's take a situation like this. Here is the meeting of two different biomes. One is a plains biome and the other is a forest. Since they don't match up with each other height-wise, I can get the height of the last block in this plains biome. And then depending on how far away on the x-axis the height values of each x position are in the forest biome, I can move each height value closer to the plains biome until they match up with each other. The code for doing this looks very confusing, but all that we do is calculate the distance on the y-axis each height value is from the interpolation value. 
and then scale it based on how far away it is. This variable biome smoothing distance determines how much of the chunk is affected by the interpolation. So 8 of the 16 blocks are affected, resulting in some very nice transitions between the biomes. There was, however, some pretty interesting bugs along the way while I was working on this. Now, right now there are only two biomes, a plains and a forest biome. And as we all know, Minecraft has many, many more biomes than that. So let's add a couple more. To add new biomes, all I have to do is to create a new file to store information about each biome, such as how tall the terrain is, what kind of trees are allowed to generate, and block generators that allow the biomes to use unique blocks. Here, for example, is the file for a desert biome. You can see here that the desert has a tree type of 3, which, if we look into our code, corresponds to cactus. If we run the game with these new files and move around, we quickly stumble upon a desert, and I even added a custom sand wall to the surface. I also added a birch forest biome as well, and for some reason I find the birch logs really satisfying looking. Now more biomes will be added in the future, but for now we can mark adding biomes off of our to-do list. The next thing I want to work on is more of a visual improvement, but it will be really interesting, which is a day-night cycle. Coding a day-night cycle was an interesting challenge to tackle because of how confusing I ended up making the code to change the sky color. All of this code you see is responsible for blending the color of the sky together, and the color depends on the time of the day that it is. The way the time of the day changes is that I wrote a timekeeping class called Game Time that can count up to 24,000 ticks. Why 24,000? Well, there are 24 hours in a day. So just like the real Minecraft, each hour corresponds to a thousand ticks. I think it's a pretty nice system, and I added the current daytime to a little debug menu I've been working on. Anyways, the sky color is stored inside of two separate arrays, for both the top and the bottom of the screen. I did this so certain times of the day could have two colors displayed simultaneously. This is useful in the morning to show how the sky would be a more yellowish color on the horizon as the sun rises. Now I'm going to have the game run through a full day-night cycle so you can see what the whole thing looks like. So enjoy! I hope you enjoyed that. If you're wondering how I came up with the timings to change the brightness of the screen, I kept everything in this abomination of a Desmos, but it's pretty helpful for things like this. I will add the sun and the moon at a later date, but for now, let's mark the day-night cycle off of our to-do list. There's one last thing that I want to add today, and that is the character most associated with Minecraft in the first place, which is Steve. I first strip down the skin of Steve into the relevant sides of the body. All I need is the side view of the head, torso, leg, and arms. And these are different for both sides to make the model look more detailed. Once I had the textures ready, I manually wrote out code to render each body part into its relevant position. The best part of this whole process was the many, many bugs I had. Like this one where the texture wasn't being scaled correctly. Or this one when I was working on rotating the limbs for the walking animation, but it went horribly wrong. But in the end, this is how it turned out. The speed and rotation of the limbs depend on how fast the player is moving. And if you walk in the opposite direction of the way that you are facing, you move slower. To actually change directions, you simply move the mouse to the other side of the player. Oh yeah, did I mention that I added collision? I've been working on this video for so long, I actually forgot all the things that I've added so far. I even added some more blocks underground, being andesite, granite, diorite, and gravel. And I made the caves a more reasonable size too, so it's really starting to look like Minecraft now. We actually got a lot done in this episode, from adding caves and walls, to creating the first biomes and adding a day and night cycle, and ending it off with the player model of Steve. We have made significant progress. Thanks for sticking around to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, dropping a like and a comment really means a lot to me. 
as I read all of your guys' comments. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye